Hello and welcome to Inventing Civilization, the YouTube channel where we take a closer look at the history of political thought and philosophy. In this episode, Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun was born in Chinis in 1332 to parents of Andalusian origin who had fled the Iberian Peninsula under the threat of invading Christian armies. The Islamic world had at this point begun its decline. Three quarters of a century earlier, the Mongols had sacked Baghdad, and the Islamic lands had now come under threat from foreign powers as well as the plague. But in spite of this chaotic backdrop, the Islamic world continued to produce scientific advances and revolutionary thinkers, none more so than Ibn Khaldun. Khaldun enjoyed a classical Islamic education in Tunis and he spent most of his adult life serving in various government functions throughout the Western Mediterranean. His most well-known work is the Muqaddima, which is only the first part of his Kitab al-Ibar, an extensive work on the history of the known world. He also wrote a uniquely candid autobiography. The value of Khaldun's works lies in the fact that he thought of history as something worth studying rather than simply narrating. He was, in a way, the first true historian the world had ever known. He also provided us with a detailed, reliable and relatively rare non-Western view on the history of civilization. Khaldun's study of history is deeply sociological. His theory of human history is cyclical and relies on a thorough analysis of human nature. Like Aristotle, Khaldun thought man was political by nature, meaning association in group form was both necessary and inevitable. At the heart of this, according to Khaldun, was the concept of Asabiya. Asabiya, which loosely translates into social solidarity or social cohesion, is a bond of fellowship that joins a community together, and it exists in different forms. It is strongest as the blood bond between people who are related to each other, but it also binds people and groups together through alliance and clientship. Asabiya was strongest in primitive cultures, such as for example the nomadic tribes that resided in many Islamic lands. They relied entirely on Asabiya to fight off beasts and hostile tribes, as well as to provide food and water for their kin. So, in this setting, Asabiya encompassed affection and the willingness to self-sacrifice. But it also fostered a certain hierarchy. The core of the tribe was usually formed by a certain family or handful of families, people who shared a blood bond, while the rest of the tribe fell into the wider circles of Asabiya, allies and clients. Asabiya then became the basis for government typically a variety of monarchy, whose chief function was to ensure stability and to impose justice. This, in turn, fostered increasing civilization, and that allowed humans to move on from a tribal, nomadic existence to founding cities and even building empires. But there was a problem in all of this. You see, in the early stages of nation-building, Asabiya is like a strong glue holding a tribe together. It's based heavily on self-sacrifice for the sake of the tribe. Threats are external and Asabiya allows a tribe to be fierce and to conquer other tribes. But as the tribe turns into a nation featuring other tribes, the situation begins to change. The leader of the original tribe has at this point established royal power. Threats are no longer exclusively external, they are internal as well. The leader's power and position might be challenged. So to consolidate his power, the leader is now forced to act against some of his own kin, often relying on mercenaries to do so. And all this is erosive of Asabiya. Also erosive of Asabiya is increased luxury. The leader and those around him live increasingly luxurious lives, which corrupts them. On the one hand, they lose their warrior spirit, while on the other, they become obsessed with wealth. So, the leadership now becomes an expensive burden on the state, incapable of proper rule and endlessly raising taxes to pay for its own lavishness. Where it used to impose justice, it now imposes injustice. It begins, in short, to exploit its own people, which inevitably leads to its downfall. The central leadership is then either replaced by another dynasty or its power is fragmented 
and flows to regional authorities, which effectively breaks up the states. And so we have come full circle. So, in conclusion, using the concept of as sabia Khaldun explained how dynasties and civilizations rise and then fall. He thought this cycle typically lasted three to four generations, by his count, 120 years. Now, at this point in the lecture, I typically offer you the solutions the philosopher in question proposed, but unlike, say, Al-Farabi, who I covered in an earlier video, Khaldun shied away from offering an extensive analysis of alternative systems of government. He emphasized the importance of things like rationality and the rule of law to shield us from anarchy, but he didn't say whether either of these might help us prevent or slow down the collapse of the state. Although his insistence on the inevitable and cyclical nature of it all would seem to suggest not. So, Khaldun largely leaves us to our own devices. In the 21st century, his emphasis on social solidarity, as Sabia, teaches us that even modern multicultural societies need some common values to bind them all together. And his work helps us understand the origins and consequences of civilizational turbulence, such as the Arab Spring. But where we go from there, well, that's up to us. And that concludes this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, if you'd like to learn more or cite this video, please check the description box below. For now, though, I want to thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.